Bibles back to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. We're going to finish up this section that we've been in for a few weeks now, our third week now. Look specifically at 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 11 this week. And this is a passage that we started in verse 7. If you remember that, the title of the message is Living in Sight of the Consummation. Living in Sight of the Consummation. This is part three of this series. And at the very beginning, if you remember, we read these words from Peter. The end of all things is at hand. The end of all things is at hand. That phrase was meant to communicate a sense of urgency to us. It was meant to motivate us, to motivate believers to make the most of our time. To consider this time that it is that we are living, to consider how we are dwelling in a time of imminence, living in the shadow of the return of Christ. But as we discuss, the direction that he then turns our focus is maybe surprising to some, because he turns us then toward the local church. And as we live inside of the return of Christ, inside of the consummation of all things, he teaches us how we are to focus our attention then on the normal means of grace expressed in the body of believers. How we interact with one another. What we are doing in terms of speaking to one another and serving one another. He encourages us then to be at work diligently serving the body of Christ. In part one of this series, we saw how as we turn our eyes towards final things... We are to commit ourselves to praying with clarity and control according to the scriptures and overcoming sin through love. Then in part two, this understanding of love for one another drives us to have a right heart and hospitality toward one another. To serve one another according to the source of our spiritual giftedness, according to the things that the Lord has given us. And to take seriously the, the responsibility of God's blessing that He has bestowed upon us in this time. We are to turn and love one another as Christ has loved us. All of this for the mutual edification of the body of Christ. So, what are we to give our attention to as we live inside of the consummation? It is to our relationships with one another to one another who are saved, to each person who has likewise been transformed by the Spirit of God. Everything that we do must be to this end. And so this week in part three of Living Inside of the Consummation, he finalizes how we are to serve one another in the body of Christ with the ultimate end goal. That in everything we do as we serve one another, we are to do this to the glory of God. We are to do this to His exaltation. The means by which we glorify God in the body, then now, he points out, is divided into two categories. Summarizing how we use our spiritual gifts within the body. We now minister to one another through our speech. And our actions, we minister to one another verbally and through serving, by speaking the truth of love and doing acts of service. And so this week, as we look at this last verse, we're going to see three ministerial principles that guide us in the last days. Three ministerial principles that guide us in the last days. The first is the verbal aspect of ministry. The verbal aspect of ministry. The second is the service aspect of ministry. The service aspect of ministry. And the third, the purpose of all ministry. The purpose of all ministry. Three ministerial principles that guide us in the last days. So look with me now at 1 Peter chapter 4. I'll begin reading in verse 7. I'm going to read through verse 11, but we're only going to cover verse 11 this morning. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. He says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, 
Be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I pray this morning that your name would be glorified. I ask that you would be glorified through the truth of your word, and that you would be glorified as we are conformed to its truth, that you would be glorified in our hearts and in our minds, and we would lift up praise to you glorifying you for who you are and what you've done. I also pray, Lord, that as we leave here today, that this would be the trajectory of our lives, that we would live to your glory. And so, Lord, as you've laid out for us how we must do this this morning, please order us according to this truth, that we would glorify you through the things that we say speaking your truth to all those who will hear, and that we will glorify you through the things that we do, serving one another in acts of Christ-like love. And through the testimony of our lives and the testimony of our speech, you would use us as instruments of your glory. It's in your name that I pray. So this first ministerial principle that we're going to look at in verse 11, the beginning of verse 11, the verbal aspect of ministry, he says, whoever speaks as one speaking the utterances or the oracles of God. This first aspect encompasses then all speaking ministry within the sphere of the Christian community. This is everything that we speak, that we proclaim, that we teach in reference to the truth of God's Word. When he says whoever speaks, this is a universal application to all those who would speak according to his truth. But this is directly related to the local church. This is speech that is in line with biblical truth and meant then to edify the body of Christ. Such speech would include the preaching of the Word on the Lord's Day. It would include the teaching of biblical truth in group study sessions or Sunday school hours. It would include the regular ministry of the Word in one-on-one discipleship as believers fellowship together from house to house and with one another. It is the regular ministry of the Word as we counsel one another and bring one another to the truth. The specific discipleship ministry of the Word in all of its application is what he's referring to here. This is all types of verbal proclamation of truth from God's Word so as to build up believers and for the salvation of the lost. This is for us. This is for all of us. Not just pastors and teachers, not just counselors, but all those who would disciple, all those who would share the gospel, all those who would speak from biblical truth. This is for the body of Christ. So we all must take seriously what he's saying here. The Great Commission calls the body of Christ to go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them 
to obey all that Christ commanded. In order to do that, we must be committed to the verbal ministry of the Word. First and foremost, in order to make disciples, a gospel message must be proclaimed, and it must be accurate according to the truth of the Word. We must present the message of salvation as it is presented in the Bible. And as disciples are made, we must then commit ourselves to teaching these people to obey all that Christ has commanded. This is something that the whole church gives itself to, edifying one another, leading one another in the truth, so that we may all be found faithful in Christ. Pastors and teachers have a specific calling in this way to proclaim the truth of the Word, but likewise, each and every one of us is called to take part in this process. Older men, older men in the faith, speaking biblical truth to younger men. Older women in the faith, speaking truth to younger women. Each Christian household, speaking truth to one another. Parents raising up children according to biblical truth, coming together in the context of the local church, edifying one another according to God's Word. This declaration extends out to every believer at any time that you are in a situation where you must speak God's Word to an audience or an individual. This is for all those who would speak. And so this is for all of us. Now he says, as you speak, as you proclaim, whoever speaks then this is the way that you must speak. He says, as one speaking the utterances of God. And so when you're ministering the truth verbally, he says, this here is the manner in which you must do it. Some translations say utterances, others say oracles. This is specifically referring to the words of God. It has a prophetic sense to it. And not that you should consider that you yourself are literally prophesying when you're speaking, but you must recognize the very source from which you are speaking. If you are going to take on this task, if you are going to speak from the truth of God, then you must recognize what that source is, because it is prophetic. It is directly handed to us from the mind of God Himself. You then are handling the most precious information that has ever been handed down to the human race. The words that are contained in our Bible, this is the Word of God. It is clear. It is specific. It is exclusive. It is perfect. And so we must handle it with care. Consider the source. Consider the source. The source from which the Word of God flows is the source of all things. It is coming forth from the mind of the Creator, the God of the universe, the One who spoke in the beginning and things came into being, the One who has given us spiritual truth according to His wisdom and understanding through the centuries, and the One who has packaged it all together in the completed context of our Bibles today. It is coming from Him. And so when we minister verbally, we must recognize who we are representing and what kind of information it is that we are communicating Think about it this way. What if you were an emissary, a delivery person who represented a mighty nation, and ruling over this mighty nation was the greatest king in all the earth, a mighty king, a wise king, an all-knowing king, and you were handpicked by this king to deliver a very special message to a particular people. And this message was written down in a letter by the king's own hand. And it was sealed by the king's signet ring. And this letter was placed in your hand. And you were given very careful.
careful instructions as to who you were to look to deliver it to and how you were to deliver it. And so it's your job to take this vital letter of instruction to the person that this king intended it for. Now, how would you handle that letter? If you got hot on your journey, would you pull it out and use it to fan your face, cool yourself down? If you needed a scratch piece of paper, would you pull it out and write something on the back of it? Would you toss it around, lose track of it, not know where it was when you were staying somewhere for the night? How seriously would you take that job? Would you treat this letter with the same flippancy that we treat many other things in our life? Or would you hide it away in the safest place possible? Would you lock it up, protecting it from anyone and protecting it from the elements, making certain this message isn't obscured or damaged, or making certain that it doesn't fall into the hands of the wrong person? so that you may accurately hand it over to the specific people it is intended for, keeping its message together as it was intended to be presented. Now, how much more important, then, is the divine message of truth that's handed down to us in the Word of God? Infinitely more important. Infinitely more valuable. God is the source divine truth, and it is his very mind that has given us our scriptures. Psalm 19.10 says of the word of God, of these scriptures, they are more desirable than gold, even more than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. This is the value of the word of God. Psalm 119.72 it says, the law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. This is the value of the word of God to the psalmist. There, there is not a value. In other words, you cannot place value on it. Right here in our own letter in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 24 through 25, he says, All flesh is like grass, and all its glory is like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. The comparison between all things in this earth, the flesh of this earth, the people of this earth, with the word of God, it is infinite. There's nothing in this earth that is more valuable there is nothing in this earth that is more important than the Word of God. It is the asset of greatest worth. And yet, when we speak about the truths of God, is this the way that we treat it? Are we committed to accurately understanding this Word and then correctly communicating it to others? Do we take that task this seriously? If we're to speak the truth of the words of others, we must devote ourselves to understanding its great worth and then communicating according to its great worth. If you're going to be used of God in the verbal ministry of the word, you must take that task as seriously as possible. You must feel the weight of worth God's truth. You are ministering according to God Himself. And yet, when we look across the evangelical landscape, when we look at so many churches out there in this world today, how flippantly do they treat the Word of God? There are so many, so many, who claim to be preachers of truth, claim to be teachers of righteousness. And yet, as they stand and they proclaim things with authority, they don't even understand the Word of God themselves. It's prevalent. It's everywhere. And I wonder, do any of these even consider that 
when they stand before God on Judgment Day, they will give an account as to how they handled the Word of God and how they represented it to God's people. Because they will. They will. That's what 1 Corinthians 3 is talking about. They're building with something. Everyone who speaks truth, claiming it is truth according to God, is building with something. You're either building with something that will last, or you're building with something that will be burned away. And all of us who speak according to God's truth must take that reality seriously. Let us never be like those who treat God's Word carelessly. Let us never be like those who treat it flippantly. Let us never be like those who come up with our own concepts of biblical truth and our own types of theology that are external to the text and then present those things as if it's coming from the Word of God. Lest we even be compared to Satan himself. When we speak according to biblical clarity, then, we likewise must speak from a position of total humility, submitting ourselves only to what the text says, committing ourselves to its clarity, never devising cunning words and ideas from our own wisdom, but rather regarding our own intellect as foolish and chaining ourselves to the source of all wisdom, and that is the wisdom from God, is God himself. This must be our commitment. And so as we speak, as we speak to others, as we counsel others, as we disciple others, as we minister to others, as we advise others, as we come alongside others in their trials and their hardship, and we try to encourage them, as we come alongside our brother or sister who is caught in sin, as we stand and we teach others, as we lead groups, as we preach, as we proclaim, let us consider the very source from which we are teaching the value of the Word of God. And because He is the source then, then as we speak according to this source, we speak with authority. The authority not from within us, but the authority from this very word. This word has all authority in all things, in all the earth. It is entirely perfect. It is entirely sufficient. And so, if we are accurate in our understanding, and accurate in how we are presenting this understanding to others, then what we are presenting then, then is authoritative. And in that, we likewise recognize the source. And we can stand with confidence, even in the, when the world sets itself against us, even when those in evangelicalism may come against the things that we're saying, if we are convinced of the truth of the Word and the things that we proclaim, we can stand faithfully against all. And yet we still do so with great humility, recognizing that it's not from our own authority, it's not from our own wisdom, it's not from our own mind that we're speaking. It is simply a repetition of the prophetic word. So as those who speak, as those who minister, as those who disciple, as those who counsel, let us speak as those who are speaking the oracles of God. Because that is our source. That is our source. That is the first aspect of ministry, this verbal aspect of ministry, the proclamation of the truth of God's Word, speaking as though we are speaking the utterances of God Himself. Now the second, the service aspect of ministry. The service aspect of ministry. Back in verse 11, he says, Whoever serves as one serving by the strength which God supplies. And just as the statement directed to the verbal ministry of the Word is all-encompassing, so 
This statement here is directed to anyone within the visible body of Christ, all those who serve one another in the context of the local church. Now, we've talked about that in Sunday school for some weeks now, and we discussed that this morning in the adult Sunday school hour, how we all influence others. We all impact others with our lives and with the things that we do, the way that we live, and how we do things for other people. And we must be driven by intentionality in all of that. We must be oriented towards other people. We must live in such a way as to intentionally impact the lives of others. This is the calling that we've been called to. This was exemplified for us in Jesus Christ, who came to this earth to serve. That was the very purpose behind why he came. He came serving his disciples. He came meeting their spiritual needs. He came teaching them and serving the others who would follow him. He came ultimately to die for the sins of all those who belong to him. And in so doing, he represented for the world the ultimate act of service by taking the sins of all those who belong to him, taking them upon himself, bearing the wrath of God for sin, paying the penalty that was meant for us, conquering death through his resurrection, going to heaven where he now lives, living forever. He served us ultimately in bringing us to salvation. And so all of us, all of us in the body of Christ now are called to imitate him, to serve, to serve one another, to give of ourselves for the benefit of one another. This is what we do in the local church. This is what we do in our Christian households. This is what we do with every relationship that we have with other believers. We seek to serve. In fact, this is so very often the governing aspect of much of what we do as believers. Turn to Philippians chapter 2. Look at verses 2 through 4. Paul here is speaking to the church and he's instructing the church how they may maintain a mindset of unity. He says in verse 2 Fulfill my joy that you think the same way by maintaining the same love, being united in spirit, thinking on one purpose. And then he says, doing nothing from selfish ambition or vain glory, but with humility of mind, regarding one another as more important than yourselves, not merely looking out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Christians are to live out their lives with the presence of mind of how can I meet the needs of those around me? In the choices that I make, in the things that I do, as I'm going about my life, as I'm coming to church, as I'm going to work, as I'm interacting with my family, how can I be the kind of person who gives sacrificially of my time and energy to make others' lives better? How can I imitate Christ for them? How can I imitate Christ for my spouse? How can I imitate Christ for my children? How can I imitate Christ for those that I interact with daily? How can I imitate Christ for my fellow believers in the local church? How can I give of myself for what's best for them? This is the governing principle of the life of the believer. But you think that sounds almost impossible. How can we live that kind of life? How can we give ourselves to such a monumental task? That's why he says here, whoever serves then in this manner, as one serving by the strength which God supplies. 
See, we are to provide this kind of service to one another and to the church according to the power that God sustains us with to persevere in this calling. So first, we are to work as though we are working for God. And second, we are to work as those who are empowered by God. We are working for God and we are working as those who are empowered by God. And that's why it goes on in Philippians chapter 2 there to say, we are to have this way of thinking in ourselves, which was also in Christ. And what was the thinking that was in Christ? He did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. Not only by becoming a Not only living amongst men on the earth, not only being treated like a man, which was an amazing condescension in and of itself, but the mind of Christ was the mind of self-sacrifice to the point of death. He laid his life down and died for all those whom he was serving. And in so doing, he secured for us the means by which we may serve. You see, Christ was not only not only the example of how we must live, but He is the power behind how we're able to live this way. See, all those in the world, all those who are apart from Christ, how do they live? They are born into sin. They are born into depravity. They are born into self-exaltation, self-gratification. Self-glorification. They are oriented towards self. They are about what is best for them. They are about building themselves up. And even as those who are in the world act religious and they try to be moral externally, they are still ultimately doing it for self. Think about that. All the religions in the world that are works-based, what's the point? They are working for something. They are working for merit. They are working for salvation. They are doing something so that they will receive something. That is not a pure heart. That is not true love. You see, if your neighbors do things for you out of a desire to receive something in return in eternity, that's not a pure heart. They're doing that so they can get something back in the end. But that's what all those who are in the world do. That's what they're driven by. Self. Ultimately, they are driven for self. It's only God's restraining grace that keeps this world from being as wicked and depraved and self-gratifying as everyone in this world could possibly be. God, thank restrains them, but ultimately, if his hand was pulled back, we couldn't imagine the evil and the atrocities that go on here, that would go on here in the name of self, in the name of self, because that's what we're all born into. We are all born into this life. We're all born into this sin nature. We're all born oriented towards what is best for me and what's going to make me feel the best. And the world just feeds this idea. The world tells you you have to look out for self. The world tells you learn to love self. The the world tells you take a day for self and gratify yourself. The world tells you don't deny yourself. But that's not what Christians are called. Christians are called to the very opposite of self. Christians are called to put away self. Christians are called to die to self. Christians are called to crucify our desires that gratify self. We are called to serve God and others, mortifying self. John Owen wrote a book called The Mortification of Sin concept behind that book is that all those who are true followers of Christ 
must be committed to mortifying self, killing self. The self that drives us towards the gratification of our flesh. And so as Christians, we must put away this life because this life is the life of the lost. This life of self is the life of the unregenerate. And it is self that we must cast away. But we cannot do that in our own power. See, we don't desire ultimately to put others' needs above our own unless God has worked within ourselves. That's what the rebirth is. That's what regeneration is all about. You see, we don't simply choose to follow God based on our own ability because we can't do that. If we were to choose, we would always choose self because of the nature of sin within us. Now, we can make many choices, but we would always choose within that nature. And that nature is always ultimately going to be self-gratifying. So in order for us to live this way, a change has to happen. A transformation. And that's what Jesus was teaching Nicodemus about being born again. That's what we mean when we say that a person must be regenerate. That's what Ezekiel 36, 26 means when it says, I will take your heart of stone and I will put a new heart within you, a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you. You see, when the gospel is preached, when we hear this information from this perfect and sufficient source about our depravity, about our sin, about our trajectory and orientation towards self, and then we hear from this truth that because of our sin nature, we deserve hell, we deserve condemnation, we deserve an eternal punishment because we have offended an eternal God. We hear that information and we recognize, like the publican did, that we are unworthy and that we do deserve punishment. And we recognize our needy state. We recognize our state of destitution before God. And then we cry out to God and we have the information of truth, which is the gospel presented, the grace of God, that Christ came and gave us an answer for the state of destitution. And the answer to that state of destitution is the work that Christ did according to that mindset, a mindset of laying himself down for us. And so he took the penalty. That is what the good news is. The penalty is paid in Christ. And then he conquered death for us so that we may be resurrected and live with him. That is the good news. The information of the gospel presented from the all-sufficient word of God. And when we hear that, the Holy Spirit, if you are being saved, uses that information to bring into a right understanding of truth. You recognize your state of sin. You recognize your state of need. And you believe the truth of the gospel. That there are no works that you can do to save yourself. There is no way that you can bring yourself out of the state that you're in. And so you're totally dependent upon God himself for salvation. And when you trust in that, you are trusting from a heart it's been changed by God. You see, it is an intellectual affirmation to truth, but it's an intellectual affirmation that is born out of a heart that believes. And the heart that believes is the heart that has been transformed by God. Now, it's from that transformed heart that we are able to put off self. Because we are now no longer oriented towards the flesh, we are oriented towards God. We now follow Him as Lord. We now seek to serve Him above all else. And because we seek to serve Him out of a heart that's been changed by Him, 
we will likewise serve one another. This is the evidence of regeneration within us. It's the evidence that we're different, that we've been transformed, that a miraculous work has happened to us. And no one can truly selflessly serve apart from this work within them. And so, as we serve, we are to serve as those who are serving in the strength which God provides. That's the strength. The transformed heart. A heart that's been changed by the Holy Spirit. But it's not simply that He changes our heart and He leaves us there. You see, Jesus promised His disciples that He would bring a helper to us. And that Spirit that has changed our heart, He now lives within us permanently, indwelling us, empowering us to persevere, conforming us to the truth of His Word. And so the more of the truth of God's Word that we put within ourselves, the more the Spirit conforms us to this truth, and He empowers us to truly serve one another with a pure heart that desires what is best for others above ourselves. Only those who have been saved can do this. Only those who have been transformed can act. And there are plenty of people out there who try to put on a show externally, who try to be righteous externally, who try to do good works externally. But when you peel back the layers, many of them have a heart that is still dead and self-serving. It is only the person empowered by God through salvation who is pure and right from the inside out. And so as we serve, we serve with mind of Christ. We serve because of what he's done for us. And we serve in the power that he has given us to persevere. We serve as those who are new creations. And so when we do this, we recognize it's, it's not anything that we've done. Just like we recognize it's not according to our wisdom that we speak, it's not according to our power that we serve. It is according to God. It is according to His words and His power that we accomplish these things. And what that means then is that there is no merit that we can take upon ourselves for anything. We can't, we can't take credit for any of it. None of it. And that's exactly what this third purpose of ministry is about. The third principle here, the purpose of all ministry. The purpose of all ministry last part of verse 11, he says, so that, notice that, here's a purpose statement here, so that in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and might forever and ever. Amen. When he says, in all things, that is all things that have affected us as believers, whether it be our speech, whether it be our conduct, whether it be anything that is related to our salvation, in all of these things that are flowing out from us, God is glorified because all of these things are the evidence that we have been transformed by God. He gets the glory. He gets the credit. There is nothing that we've done under our own power. There's nothing that we could do that was good or righteous or honorable. All of our righteousness was as filthy rags. We had nothing to offer Him. We could not choose to honor Him. We would not choose to honor Him. And we wouldn't act according to what was right. And so we had to be changed. We had to be transformed. And now we have to live according to His power. So He gets all glory. He gets all honor. And that is the very purpose of our lives as believers. To live in such a way and to speak in such a way that it constantly, consistently brings glory to God. The Westminster Shorter Catechism recognizes this purpose in its first question with the answer that Man's chief end is to glorify God. And 
and to enjoy Him forever. While many of us recognize this is true, and we do affirm that this is our ultimate purpose, do we live out the practical implications of this purpose in our lives daily? Are we committed to this purpose? The reality is we can become so distracted by the cares of the world, by our own personal desires, by our expectations in daily life, that we often forget that all of life is not about us. It's not about what we want. It's not about our desires. It's not about what's going to make us happy. In fact, all of life, all of it, is rather about glorifying God, all of life. You think about that as it relates to trials. When you encounter a very difficult situation, a very hard process that you have to go through, go through and you begin to focus on how terrible the circumstances are, what do you go to? Do you become focused on trying to alter the circumstances so that they'll be better? Or do you focus your attention on how you may glorify God in the midst of the circumstances? Our tendency, I think, is the opposite. What about when you're reviled or attacked by someone? What about when you're sinned against? Do you immediately desire to defend yourself, to protect your honor, to make certain they know they're in the wrong? Or do you focus on how you may respond to this person in such a way that will glorify God and ultimately benefit them? Do you think about what's best for them in that circumstance? What about when you're inconvenienced by the choices and preferences of others around you? Do you become annoyed by them? Do you become irritated? Or do you view it as an opportunity to defer your own will and desires to theirs and glorify God for your love for them. Every situation we find ourselves in in this life is either an opportunity to feed our own flesh or it's an opportunity to glorify God. This is every single day that we're faced with these opportunities in every relationship that we have. Husbands and wives, Believing husbands and wives in a Christian household, as we interact with one another, we are given constant, and you all know this, it is constant, constant opportunities to either glorify God or gratify ourselves. What do we choose? What do we consistently choose? Parents and children, family members, extended family members who are believers, church, the relationships that you have with one another here, we're given constant opportunity to glorify God or to gratify ourselves. That is the purpose of our life. It is to honor Him. It is to glorify Him. But so often we get so caught up in how we feel about situations or what we don't like about circumstances, about how another person is not acting in accordance with what we expect. And we let our unmet expectations and our irritations drive us and cause us to act in ways that are not glorifying to God. And so we have to bring ourselves back in each moment, in each circumstance, in each situation to this purpose and ask ourselves this question. Right now, in this situation, what is going to most glorify God? What is going to most glorify God? That's the question that we should be asking ourselves constantly. Constantly. Because this is our purpose in all these things. Now, he goes on to say here, this is the purpose. In all things, God may be glorified. And then he says, through Jesus Christ. God is glorified through Jesus Christ. This is what Peter has been alluding to throughout this epistle. That 
our lives bear testimony to the world and to one another of the transformation that Jesus Christ, through his work on the cross, has brought about within us. We are constantly and consistently given opportunities to testify to the work of Christ. Was it powerful? Was it life-changing? Did it have an impact on you? Has it transformed your behavior and your speech? The world is watching. Are we given, giving glory to God through the work of Jesus Christ within us? Are we bearing witness to His work? Because ultimately, it is to God that all glory and might belong forever and ever. That's the purpose of salvation. That's why He saved us. That's why He brought us out of the slave market of sin, purchased us, and made us new in Christ. That's why He has given us a mission and given us the power to accomplish it so that ultimately He will be glorified in all things and our lives will be lives of worship to God. This is our purpose. This is our purpose. So, to live inside of the consummation of all things is to live a life wholly dedicated to glorifying God in everything that we say and everything that we do. We are not to be chiefly concerned with earthly things, building earthly kingdoms. We are not to be overwhelmed by the direction of political tides and social movements. We are not to grow anxious at the sight of looming persecution and trials and difficulties. We are not, to, we are not called to transform society and overthrow governments. We are not to live with our eyes focused downward on this earth constantly. Rather, we are to live as those who are right on the edge of eternity. Because we are. We are. We are living in a state of imminence. And we are to live as those who recognize that this world and everything in it is passing away. It's passing away. And we're to live with confident peace regardless of what transpires around us, doing all things, ultimately, for the glory of God. And as we said, all of this so that we may present ourselves as instruments of righteousness that God will use to bring others who are lost to Himself. That's our purpose. And that is how our purpose ultimately glorifies God. Because others who are saved as a result of our testimony and our speech, when they get there, they will glorify Him as well. And so through our lives, we can take part in this process of adding more to the number of those who glorify Him. Let's be committed to this task. Let's go to Lord Lord, we come to you this morning looking at such a monumental task and recognizing the impossibility of it that we are to speak in this way and we are to live in this way, serving one another in this way. So, Lord, we rest with peace, knowing that you have given us your all-sufficient word to speak from, knowing that you have instilled your spirit within us to empower us to serve well. Thank you for giving us all the tools that we need to accomplish this impossible task. So Lord, I pray today that you would help us, Lord, to be committed to speaking as though we are speaking from you and serving as though we are serving under your power so that our lives will glorify you. Let that be the proclamation of our life. How, Lord, may we glorify you now. It's in your name that I pray.